In today's video, we're going to be seeing how it is to edit on an iPad. Now, the recent GTX 1660 video I did was made entirely on an iPad. I'm going to run you through how everything was to edit this entire video on an iPad. It's definitely interesting, so stay tuned. Now, the iPad that I'm using is the iPad Pro 11 inch, fourth generation with the Apple M2 chip, eight gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage. Going into this, I was a bit skeptical of the RAM. I, I think that video editing is a pretty RAM intensive task, so I was definitely a bit concerned there. But generally, Apple has some decent RAM optimization. And also the software I'm using is DaVinci Resolve. I heard that they had a pretty good iPad version that was very close to the desktop version. So that's why I was wanting to see how it was because if I can get a very close to desktop experience on an iPad, it's pretty cool. Also, thank you, Caleb, for letting me borrow your iPad. I appreciate it. You're adopted. But anyways, installing the software was pretty easy. It was just straight from the App Store. It was completely free, by the way. This is really a big plus of using DaVinci Resolve. Everything is free, no matter what platform using and it's a really robust editor if you take the time to learn it but once i got it installed i went ahead and looked online and see if my plugins that i use for animations and transitions would work because i do use a specific plugin and i was unsure if it would actually work natively on the ipad that's something i was definitely worried about but surprisingly the ipad just works natively with the file format they use for plugins so that was very easy to install just like desktop i also utilize a software called local send this is basically like airdrop for any platform you can think of. I use this to transfer video files to and from the iPad just because it's much easier to just have this universal airdrop method. So that's what I used. But I went ahead and sent the video files from my phone to the iPad and it did pretty good and put it straight into DaVinci Resolve. Now I am using peripherals while editing on the iPad. I didn't just use the touch controls because I think that'd be kind of uh, annoying. I primarily use a mouse and keyboard. It's also a requirement if you want to get the best experience out of DaVinci Resolve on iPad and I'll go and I'll get into that later. I did occasionally also use touch controls every now and then in external monitor but for the most part I did just use it as an iPad with house and keyboard so now when I initially created the project and loaded it into DaVinci Resolve I was a bit disappointed to see that only a handful of the usual editing tabs were on the bottom usually there's a whole entire like list of tabs on the bottom but on the iPad there are only two and the two that they did give me were the ones I definitely don't usually use the most so I was a bit disappointed however after I did a little bit of research I figured out that you could actually bind a keybind to open up up the edit tab which is i think most people use the edit tab the most but i went ahead and did that and it did pop up this is definitely a weird quirk for the ipad version that you have to bind a keybind to get the edit tab open and it is impossible to do it unless you have a keyboard plugged in so if you're using touch controls you're kind of out of luck but it's a bit of an inconvenience that i would otherwise not have if i were to use the desktop version so that's definitely something to note anyways after i got everything set up the way i liked it i went ahead and dragged in my audio i usually edit down the audio first just because i do the uh, voice over separately from the video and I like to line up the audio separately from the video. It makes more sense that way in my head. It's just the way I do things. But it was a really good experience editing down the audio. For the most part, it was basically identical to the desktop version. I didn't notice any major hitches or anything. I did mostly use the keyboard mouse to trim it down as I usually do. But I did also try and use an external monitor just to see how it would do. And it was definitely an option if you want to have a bigger screen for, you know, just to see a little more closely. But I don't think it was necessary at all for what I was doing. I also couldn't figure out how to full screen the, the software at all. I don't know why, but it just wouldn't let me. So I had to do it in a window, which is definitely a bit weird. But I mean, the option's there if you want to try it like that. Also, one of the benefits of editing on an iPad is you can sit down anywhere and do it. I was able to get in bed and just kind of use the touch controls to edit. And, you know, it was doing just fine. I mean, for the most part, it was a fine experience. Despite the fact that the edit tab isn't designed around touch controls, it was definitely serviceable. And I was able to get some stuff done while chilling in bed. And that's, that's honestly really cool. But after I did all the audio, I went ahead and place down the videos and I did that all in bed. I didn't even have to use a mouse keyboard. I just tapped and dragged it in and everything for the most part was a pretty smooth experience. After getting the gameplay roughly where I wanted to be, I got out the mouse and keyboard again to do more precise edits. I mainly just added some text and transitions between gameplay. I found it to be a lot easier to use a mouse and keyboard for that. So I, I saved the more simple drag and drop stuff for the touch controls and the more complex for the mouse and keyboard. And that was a pretty good balance, I'd say. Now the plugin I use for transitions transitions can be quite intensive on even my own setup. So it was no surprise when I saw the iPad lag here and there when applying the transitions. And that was honestly about what I experienced anyway. So it wasn't a big deal. So 
Next up, we have Resident Evil 4 Remake. I think what surprised me the most is that like this whole entire process, I didn't really feel like I was much slower than what I would be on a desktop. I think the biggest hindrance was just figuring out how to do everything at first. And then once I figured that out, it was just kind of like everything was just as it would be on desktop. It didn't hinder my uh, making fun of my own speech. So that's that's cool, I guess. Today's video, we're going to be checking out the GTX. But once I was done all the basic editing and all that, it was time to render out the video. Now, while I am rendering at 4K, a lot of the footage was at 1080p or 1440p, so it wasn't really like the most intensive thing in the world. I wasn't expecting the iPad to really struggle with it, and for the most part, it was pretty good, actually. I don't have any precise timings because it didn't show me. Usually there's like a deliver tab that lets you see, you know, all the times, but I th uh, roughly three minutes for this video, which is faster than real time. Time. So that's pretty cool, especially on this very thin, passively cool device. That that is very cool to see. It, it does go to show that Apple is really good at making very efficient running chips. The back of the iPad near the Apple logo did get a bit warm, but that was expected. And honestly, when you're rendering stuff out, you probably won't be holding it anyways. You probably put it down like I did and just let it do its thing. And yeah, it was a very good experience rendering out this video. Anyways, in conclusion, I think that editing on an iPad is definitely a viable option for people who want a very portable, very light, and very small device for on-the-go editing. Now, despite my initial worries about the RAM, it didn't seem to play any big role in problems while I was editing. The usual issues I see on DaVinci Resolve, I usually see on my main setup, and that has 64 gigabytes of RAM, so I don't think that it's a RAM issue. I just think that DaVinci Resolve has some quirks to it that carry over to iPad or desktop. doesn't matter what you're on. While a lot of what I experienced was positive, I will say that there are definitely some downsides to this. It's not all good. The main ones being that you have to to have a keyboard plugged into it in order to get the editing tab on DaVinci Resolve. I think that's the biggest problem with this is you have to like do research and like look into stuff if you're coming over from desktop because not everything is going to be one to one in terms of how you get to menus and stuff. So keep that in mind. Also, some of the key binds in general are just different just because of how iPad OS handles it versus Windows. But a place where it actually did impress me was the native plugin support. That was really cool to see how I could get my transition plugin working really easily without much hassle. And it does add a lot of flexibility to what is a very portable editing option. But my final thoughts on this is that DaVinci Resolve on the iPad is extremely close to the desktop version. And if you're considering purchasing the iPad for, you know, only go editing, I would say that it's worth it. It's really cool to see a robust editor like DaVinci Resolve on an iPad that basically runs one-to-one -one with a desktop version. Anyways, thank you guys for watching my video. Hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching.